Hi everyone. In this video, I'm showing how to compute critical values um, for some of the major uh, interval estimates that we'll be doing using Excel. So just a little review of what a critical value is or kind of what we're looking for. We're looking at some kind of distribution. In this case, this is the normal distribution, um, but we will be looking at different distributions depending upon what we're trying to estimate. Um, but we're looking at some kind of distribution of values and the idea of a critical value is that we're kind of trying to identify um, in this picture this labeled critical region. These would correspond to significantly high or significantly low values um, based on a given sample uh, when we're looking at trying to estimate population parameters. So in this case, they, they're showing that the critical values for this distribution are z equals 1.96, z equals negative 1.96. Um, we will have different values depending upon what kind of size of critical region we want. So as a first example, say we're finding critical values um, to estimate a population proportion. Um, now our calculations for estimating proportions um, use the normal distribution. So I'm imagining that normal bell curve. And I want to find critical values for a 95% confidence level in this, in this case. And this corresponds to um, an alpha value of 0 0.05, or essentially in the picture here, I want 95% of the data to be in this central white region here. And then this, uh, the 5% will fall into these two little blue areas. So one thing you always have to be thinking about when you're finding critical values is um, you know, how much area is there in each part of the graph. And I definitely recommend drawing a little picture. So in this case, um, we're using the normal distribution. And we've got an alpha value of 0 0.05, which means that 0 0.05 is getting divided up into these two little tails. Um, that means that each tail has an area of half of 0 0.05, so in this case 0 0.025. So I'm imagining 0 0.025 area in each of these tails. Now we would have to come up with, well, what is the z value? You know, it could be 1.96, but not necessarily in this case. Um, that corresponds with those areas. You should already be pretty familiar with this using the normal distribution. Um, we're going to use our normal inverse function. So our normal inverse function takes a probability or an area to the left of the value that we want. Now, keep in mind that for interval estimates, there's going to always be two critical values. Um, but with a normal distribution, they're basically the same value, but one's positive and one's negative. So if I have to put in the area to the left, I can either put in the area to the left of this point, which would be the area in this blue tail. In that case, that would be 0 0.025. Or I could also find this one by finding the area to the left of this. Um, now that would include the whole middle area, which was a 0.95 or that 95% area, as well as this extra tail. That takes just a little bit of extra computation. So typically I would start by finding the one on the left. So using this 0 0.025 as my area or my probability. And then the mean and standard deviation inputs, um, I'm just finding this for a generic normal distribution. So all of these calculations are going to be based on that standard normal, um, not given any particular mean or standard deviation uh, given in the problem. So our standard normal distribution has mean 0, standard deviation 1, so I'll plug those in. And I get, in this case, actually this value, negative 1.96. So negative 1.95996. And then the other one would just be the positive version. Um, and I know that from symmetry. But I could compute that directly if I did, um, instead of the area just to the left of this guy, the area to the left of this right-hand critical value, which in this case would be 0 0.95 plus 0 0.025. Um, I can have Excel compute this. This would be 0.975 uh, if I wanted to just plug that in. 
right? So with my mean and standard deviation, I'm expecting just the positive number of the same, a positive version of the same number. And there you go. So this would be finding critical values for a normal distribution. But not all of our problems are going to use a normal distribution. So say we're doing an interval estimate for a mean. If you talked about this in class already, um, you know that there are actually two different types of calculations for the mean. Um, one actually uses a normal distribution as well, and that would be when the standard deviation of the population is known, or that sigma known case. Um, you may have not even talked about that case in class because it's very uncommon. Um, usually we don't know the population standard deviation, and so in those cases we use a different distribution called the student t distribution. Um, it does actually look a lot like the normal distribution, but it slightly varies in shape depending upon um, the sample. So the formula we use for this looks like this. So it's got a t indicating that student t distribution, and then dot inv, that's the inverse, just like we had the inverse for the normal distribution. And then I'm using this version with 2t on the end. And what that 2t is telling us is that I want to chop off two tails. So in my picture, I'm chopping off area from two different sides. Um, there are cases in statistics where you would find a critical value for just one side or the other instead of having um, the area for both. But in interval estimates, um, we've always got these two tails, sort of the significantly high and the significantly low. So using this function, the first input we're going to put in is basically just the alpha value. This is um, 1 minus the confidence level. Um, so if we have a 95% confidence level, that would be 0.05. Notice that that is not the area in one tail. That's actually the area in both tails. And that's important because we're using this two tails function. The second input is um, what's called the degrees of freedom. Um, in, the, in the context of interval estimates, um, degrees of freedom is always 1 less than the sample size, or n minus 1. So say we've got this example here, find a critical value for a 95% confidence level if our sample size is 25. Okay, so I'm assuming that we're using a student T distribution here. Um, we've got our confidence level, our sample size. With a confidence level of 0.95 or 95%, our alpha value would be 0.05. And then the degrees of freedom would be one less than the sample size. So in this case, that would be 24. So our critical values, I'm going to use the t.inv.2t. I'm going to put in, this is saying probability. This would be my alpha value. Again, that's the area in both tails, in the two tails. So 0 0.05 in this case. And then my degrees of freedom, I'm saying 24. Um, this gives a positive number. The picture that you should be thinking about is actually still very similar to the normal distribution in that there will be a positive and a negative side to this. Um, the shape will be a little bit different than the normal distribution, but very similar. So there are actually two different critical values. Um, but in each of these cases, we're typically only going to use the positive one in our calculations. Okay, there's a third type of critical values um, for interval estimates. This would be when you're doing an interval estimate for um, a standard deviation or for a variance. Um, all the calculations are actually based on the variance, and hopefully you'll talk about that in class. Um, but in this case, we're going to be using what's called the chi-squared distribution. Um, and sometimes this is written with the Greek letter chi, which looks like a capital X, um, squared. And the chi-square distribution really looks different. Here's a picture of the chi-square distribution 
um, with a couple of different degrees of freedom. And both of these pictures, this one and the uh, critical region, these are coming from open source textbooks um, that I found online. I will link both of these textbooks below uh, in the description in case you want to check them out as resources. Um, but I just found some handy pictures here. Um, so you'll notice that this really doesn't have a bell curve shape. It's very kind of leaned to one side, very skew right. Um, and they will look a little bit different with different degrees of freedom. In fact, up above you have a degrees of freedom of two and it looks quite a bit different. Um, but this picture is kind of what you want to be thinking about. Now with the critical values, I'm still imagining cutting off tails on both sides, and I'm going to cut off tails of the same size, so they would have the same area. Um, but the critical values, you know, maybe on this side I'm getting something like 2, but on this side I'm getting something like 12 because of the scale here. So this is a different distribution, which means it different, needs a different function. Um, the function that we're going to use from Excel, um, there's actually two different versions, but it's very similar to the previous ones. So it starts with CHISQ, so this is an abbreviation of chi-squared. Um, CHI is just the spelling of that Greek letter chi. And then dot inverse, just like before. And there's two different versions, the regular dot inverse um, and the RT or right version of this. So I put a note at the bottom of the screen. The first of these formulas um, uses the area to the left as this probability input. This is just what we're used to um, with the normal distribution function. The other equation, this probability is going to indicate an area to the right. So they really function the same way. It's just are we talking about area to the right or are we talking about area to the left? And you need to choose which one makes more sense um, based on the scenario that you're looking at. Um, just like with the T distribution example, the second argument is the degrees of freedom and it will also be n minus one or one less than the sample size. Okay, so say we're gonna find the critical values for a 95% confidence level. Um, using standard deviation or estimating standard deviation when we have a sample size of 38. We know that the confidence level is 95, which would mean that the area in the two tails put together would be 0 0.05. That would be the alpha value just like we had in the student t distribution. But in this case, the, um, I want to look at the area in each tail, which would be 0 0.025 or half of that 0 0.05 value. The degrees of freedom is going to be 37, so one less than the sample size. And rather than getting plus and minus the same values for my critical values, I'm going to have two distinct numbers. So I'm going to do the left and then the right. So for the left critical value, I know that in my picture, even though it's not symmetric like this, the left critical value is going to have an area to the left of 0 0.025. So I'm going to use the chi-square function, um, the left version, so the just dot inverse, not the dot, dot RT. And I'm going to put in this probability input that area to the left. So 0 0.025 is my area to the left for that left-hand side um, value. And then my degrees of freedom was 37. And then on the right hand side, I'm going to choose the dot RT version so that I can put in the area to the right. The area to the right of the right hand critical value is also going to be 0 0.025. So by using the left and the right hand versions, um, I really kind of take the extra thinking out of you know, trying to figure out how much area is where. So you get two numbers. Notice these are very different from um, the kinds of values that we see from the normal distribution or the student t distribution. They tend to be much larger, although it does depend on um, your sample size. Uh, but notice that the left one is definitely a smaller number and the right one is a bigger number. So if you imagine one of these graphs kind of spread out as the degrees of freedom gets bigger, um, the smaller number is over here on the left side of the graph, and then that bigger 55 number would be over on the right.
So those are the three functions that we'll be using or the, the three types of functions that we'll be using for computing critical values. Thanks for watching.